Lectures on the Politics of God and the Politics of Man Lecture 6 A Christian View of Social Order and the State Part 1 Absolute Power and Authority In Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 to 20 we are told that all power and authority have been committed to Jesus Christ. This is perhaps one of the most widely known yet least understood statements in Scripture. Most Christians will immediately recognise it and be able to find it in their Bible. Yet it is one of the most ignored teachings in Scripture. Whole theologies are built on the negation of this very teaching. For example, I heard some years ago a sermon preached in a Reformed church in which the preacher assured the congregation that the Christian warfare is a matter of the spiritual life that it is in the spiritual realm that we engage with principalities and powers and seek to stand for Christ and overcome evil by means of the gospel. The congregation was sternly warned not to get involved with organisations and things happening in the world because the faith has no relevance to such things. Rather, the Christian warfare relates to a spiritual battle. Now, of course, it is true that the Christian warfare is a spiritual battle. But this preacher had so defined what spirituality means that he had created a vast chasm between the world that we live in and a higher spiritual realm that has no bearing on the everyday issues of life. This kind of dualism is very common in the church, yet it is predicated on a complete contradiction of Christ's words in Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20. Because here Christ says that all power in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Nothing in the whole created order lies beyond his authority and power. The nations of this world and their governments included. And in confirmation of this, the scripture tells us, prophesying of Christ, and I quote, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Unquote. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 to 7. In the book of Revelation this is confirmed. Quote, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Unquote. Revelation chapter 11 verse 15. And Christ commanded us to pray that his kingdom would come on earth and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. These are not obscure scriptures. They teach that the Lord Jesus Christ came to conquer the whole of the created order and redeem this lost world. Christ tells us plainly, quote, All authority has been given unto me, unquote. Likewise, Peter says that, and again I quote, Christ is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him, unquote. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 22. Christ is the only point in the whole of the created order where all power and authority are concentrated. No one else possesses such absolute power in the created order, in heaven or on earth. This power is not limited to the heavenly or spiritual realm. It is an authority that extends to everything and everyone on earth. It includes, therefore, all political authority. Because Christ is the only one in whom all power and authority in the whole cosmos is concentrated, all other legitimate powers, including all political powers, derive their authority in a delegated form from him. The authority of governments comes from Christ alone. It has to, because there is no other point in the created order where such authority could come from. Absolute power and authority in the created order has been given to Christ, and therefore any authority exercised by anyone else in the created order must ultimately come in a delegated form from Christ and from him alone. All authority of governments, therefore, comes from God through Christ. Political authority does not come from the people, though this is not to deny the validity of representative governments. 
But we must get our first principles right. All political authority comes from Christ. Who may fill the office of civil ruler may legitimately be decided by popular elections, but the authority of the political ruler comes from God through Christ as the person in whom all authority in heaven and on earth is concentrated, and therefore such political authority must be exercised in accordance with his will as it is revealed in his law. Given the fact that scripture so plainly teaches that absolute authority is given to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a matter of wonder that so many in the church should see Christ's authority as limited to the realm of the spiritual and deem his commission to his disciples to bring all nations under his discipline as having little, if any, relevance to the world of human politics. Such an understanding of the Great Commission is in truth a negation of the Great Commission. However, the prosecution of Christ's authority in the political realm is only one aspect of the Great Commission, by no means all of it. Before we look in more detail at the political implications of the Great Commission, we need to look at how the Great Commission applies generally to the nations. Christ commands us in the Great Commission to make disciples of the nations. In this command, the term all the nations is the direct object of the verb to disciple. What Jesus does not do here is to tell us to go and make disciples from among or out of all the nations. He does not refer to the discipling of individual souls. What he says is that we are to disciple the nations. It is the nations that are to be the disciples of Christ, not merely individual souls, brands snatched from the fire. Of course, this inevitably means that individual souls must be converted to the Christian faith. There can be no discipling of the nations without the salvation of individual souls. But there is a difference between a command to disciple individual souls and a command to disciple the nations. The latter includes the former but the former does not include the latter. It is possible to make individual disciples from all the nations without discipling the nations. It is not possible to disciple the nations without discipling individual souls. It is important to understand that Christ commands us to disciple the nations, not merely to make disciples from among the nations. The discipling of the nations that Christ commands us to engage in involves the whole nation, individuals, communities and society at large, including all its institutions and forms of government. No sphere of life is left out. The whole nation must come under the discipline of the Lord Jesus Christ, must live under his law and thereby conform to his will. If we are to fulfil the Great Commission, we must understand that nothing less than this total transformation of society is necessary. The Great Commission is not merely a question of discipling individual souls to the Christian faith. And the faith that overcomes the world is more than a private devotional mystery cult and Sunday services. The Great Commission requires a transformation of the whole nation, the whole of society, and indeed of the whole world. How is this to be achieved? What does a Christian social order look like? How is it structured? And how is its structure maintained? We know that Christ has all authority over everything, over all powers and subsidiary authorities. But how does his authority structure society? In the created order, Christ's authority is delegated in a limited form to several forms of government. But in none of these spheres or institutions is there a total delegation of Christ's authority. Christ delegates authority to each of these institutions or spheres and the authority he delegates is specific to that sphere, that is to say, appropriate to it and limited in its functions. No single sphere or institution is given total authority. If it were, it would be equal in authority to Christ himself, that is to say, it would possess an authority equal to God's. Now, we shall see that in the modern world this is just what civil governments, that is to say states, are increasingly doing, that is, assuming total authority over society. But this is a form of idolatry because it puts the state into the position of Christ as the one in whom all authority is concentrated. 
The Christian must reject this and insist that all authority resides in Christ alone. He is the only point in the created order where all authority is concentrated. The Christian view of social order, therefore, must maintain that any delegated authority is limited and that its limits are defined by the law of Christ, the word of God, that is to say the Bible. There is no single authority structure that possesses total authority over the nation. Only the Lord Jesus Christ possesses such authority. How does this doctrine work out in practice? The Lord Jesus Christ, in whom all authority in heaven and on earth is concentrated, delegates authority via his word or law to each individual main sphere of life. There are four spheres here. These are the three institutions that are established in the Bible as the main forms of societal government, family, church and state, plus the sphere of individual liberty and self-government. Each of these institutions has a specific role or function and an authority appropriate to it. Each receives its authority from God's word, not from any of the other spheres or institutions. The spheres of family, church and state are the main social institutions. The limit of the power and authority of the state is the sword, that is to say physical coercion up to and including, where appropriate, the death penalty. This authority it has from God, but it is, like all delegated authority, only legitimate where it is exercised in accordance with God's law. The limit of the power and authority of the family is the rod, and the limit of the power and authority of the church is excommunication. Again, this authority is only legitimate where it is exercised in accordance with God's law. This does not mean that these powers define these institutions, but they show the limits of their authority. A family is much more than the parent's authority to chastise a child, but the authority to use the rod of correction sets the limits of the parent's authority. It shows how far the father's authority extends, that is to say, this far and no further. The family, or the father, does not have the authority of the sword, that is to say, he does not have authority from God's word to execute his criminal offspring. A father must hand a criminal son over to the civil magistrate, the state, to be prosecuted and punished for his crimes. See Deuteronomy chapter 21 verses 18 to 21. The father's authority is permitted to go no further than the rod. This is in stark contrast to the Roman laws of the Twelve Tables, for example, which permitted the father to exercise absolute authority over his family and slaves, granting him the right, as their judge, to kill those under his authority. The Bible denies this authority and power to the family. The family must hand a criminal son over to the state to be dealt with. Likewise, the state may administer the death sentence in capital offences, but that is the limit of the state's authority. The state does not have authority or power to excommunicate anyone, nor may the state interfere with the family's legitimate exercise of authority. It may only act where crime, as defined by God's word, has been committed. The state may not, therefore, without illegitimately usurping the legitimate authority of the family, pass laws that ban the use of the rod in the physical punishment of children by their parents. In England, the state has now banned the use of a rod in the punishment of children by parents, and there is an ongoing campaign to ban smacking in England also. Such law is illegitimate. It is unlawful law, in the sense that English law, traditionally, has been based on the Christian doctrine of the rule of law, which stipulates that all man-made law must conform to the higher law of God, and reason, which of course amounts to the same thing. The state may act where a crime has been committed, and therefore if a parent commits grievous bodily harm against a child, the state may act, and rightly so. But the law already covers this, and there is no need for a law banning smacking and the use of the rod by parents. Such laws are a direct attack on the law of God and the social order it is meant to create and maintain. The church is also limited in her authority. She may not use coercion or physical punishment of any kind. 
the power of the church is limited by the act of excommunication. If a member of the church apostatizes from the faith and refuses to repent after due admonition, the maximum that the church may do is excommunicate the person, that is to say, refuse to accept him into the company of professing believers and deny him the privileges that belonging to that community confers. If he has committed crimes, the state must punish him, not the church. The church is required to excommunicate unrepentant sinners. If the criminal repents of his crime, the church must accept him into the fold, even if the state must execute him for his crimes. The medieval doctrine of benefit of clergy is therefore contrary to the biblical order and an abuse of the church's legitimate authority in which she usurps the authority and functions of the state. All such usurpation of authority, whether by the family, church or state, leads to tyranny in which one institution with a limited role in society and an authority appropriate to that role assumes the powers and authority of other God-ordained institutions. This inevitably means a loss of freedom. The modern state is the institution that now claims total authority over society, and in so doing it acts the tyrant and takes away our liberty. But the church has been as guilty in times past. The medieval Roman Catholic doctrines of the two swords and direct power claim that the Pope has been given both spiritual and temporal authority by Christ, and on the basis of this belief, the papacy sought to exercise dominion over the state. The doctrine of the two swords was based on an allegorical reading of Luke chapter 22 verse 38, and claimed that the two swords mentioned in the text represented spiritual and temporal authority, both of which have been entrusted to Peter and his successors. According to St Bernard, therefore, and I quote, we are instructed by the words of the gospel that two swords are in the power of Peter, the spiritual and the temporal. In fact, when the apostles said, there are two swords here, that is, in the church, the Lord did not reply, that is too much, but that is enough. Certainly, he who denies that the temporal sword is in Peter's power forgets the Lord's word, put back thy sword in its sheath. Both swords are thus in the power of the church, the material and the spiritual, but the former is wielded on behalf of the church, the latter by the church, the latter by the hand of the priest, the former by the hand of the king or knight, on the word and with the consent of the priest. It is in fact needful that one sword should be below the other and that the temporal authority should be subject to the spiritual authority. Unquote. According to Joseph Leclerc, and again I quote, In the eyes of believers in the direct power, the spiritual power includes the temporal. The one is no more than an emanation of the other. Christ, who is at once priest and king, has delegated to Peter and his successors the whole of his power. The Pope possesses in principle all jurisdiction in civil as well as in religious affairs, in feudal language, he has a direct right of eminent domain over everything, and at the epoch, let us remember, eminent domain meant real ownership. Unquote. The doctrines of the two swords and the direct power gave the church an absolute authority that was beyond her legitimate role from the biblical perspective. In the Christian doctrine of social order, each sphere is limited in the kind and degree of its authority so that no single institution wields total authority. Christ alone reserves that right to himself. The Christian theory of social order maintains a balance or separation of powers that restricts the authority of any one institution. In each of these spheres, those who legitimately exercise power receive their authority from God through Christ via his word. This last qualification is important. These institutions do not have direct access to God for their power and authority. This authority comes ultimately from God, of course, but it is mediated through Christ via his law, the Bible. Even the kings of Israel in the Hebrew theocracy were admonished to study the law so that they might do justice according to God's word. 
They were to look to God's law for their wisdom in executing justice, not to personal divine revelations from the Lord. See Deuteronomy chapter 17 verses 18 to 20. Such words came from God to the prophets, not to the kings, and kings were expected to listen to the words of the prophets, but they were required to know the law of God and to test all prophetic claims against it, since even the prophets were under the rule of God's law. See, for example, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 to 6. Again, this demonstrates a division or separation of powers so that no one person possessed total power and authority. The Bible does not support the doctrine of the divine right of kings or its modern equivalent, the absolute right of elected governments with popular mandates. In fact, the Bible contradicts this doctrine in the most forthright way. Authority, even the authority of the state and the church, is always limited and defined by God's law. Each sphere, therefore, receives an authority from God through Christ via his word. Each has a limited function. The state does not raise children and must not meddle with the family's legitimate role and authority in this sphere. Neither does the church execute public justice, though of course it does have a duty to proclaim the word of God, which addresses a sphere of public justice. The church, therefore, has a role in calling the state and the family to obey the word of God and in teaching God's law to those who hold office in the state and to members of families. But the church does not execute public justice on evildoers. She proclaims the word of God and also demonstrates God's mercy in her care for the sick, for orphans and widows, secondary welfare functions. The family raises children and provides for the welfare and education of its members, primary welfare functions, not the state. Along with a limited role in society, each sphere receives an authority appropriate to it. This authority is limited in its nature by the function of the particular institution to which it is granted. All these institutions or spheres must function according to God's word. The authority they exercise is not autonomous or sovereign. It is the authority of God delegated to each sphere via his word, and therefore each sphere is entirely dependent upon God's word for its legitimacy. Each sphere derives its functions and authority from God's word. For any one of these spheres or institutions to claim a total authority, a total sovereignty, so that it sets itself up above the others and seeks to control them, as modern secular states do, is an act of rebellion against Christ, to whom they owe an absolute obedience, and an attempt to usurp his unique office as the one to whom all authority, in heaven and on earth, has been committed by God the Father. All who do this are setting themselves up as idols, rivals to the Lord Jesus Christ. States that behave in this way will perish, as scripture tells us, see Psalm 2. Besides these three institutions or spheres, there is a fourth sphere. This is the sphere of the individual and individual liberty. This is the sphere where the other spheres or institutions have no authority. Not only does no individual institution control the whole of society, neither do all these institutions together control the whole of society. Where the authority of family, church and state ceases, there is individual liberty. This sphere of individual liberty is a very extensive one. Neither the family, the church nor the state are responsible individually or together for enforcing the whole of God's law. Much of God's law requires personal self-government and falls into the sphere of individual responsibility. Each individual sphere operates on the other spheres only in accordance with its God-given function. A crime committed in or by the church is investigated by the state, not the church. But the state does not thereby interfere with the church's legitimate freedom. If the church refuses to let the state investigate a crime committed by the church, she interferes with the proper functioning of the state. Likewise, the state has the duty to investigate crimes committed by family members, but it does not have the right to interfere with the role and legitimate authority of the family or to tell the family how to organise its affairs. This view of social organisation is based on the doctrine of sphere sovereignty. 
which is associated with Abraham Kuyper and the Dutch neo-Calvinist school of thought that flourished in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in Holland under his leadership. But we must not think of these spheres as being sovereign in themselves. Rather, they are recipients of the sovereignty of God, as this is delegated to and limited for each specific institution. Kuyper systematically set down this doctrine in a series of lectures given at Princeton Theological Seminary in 1898, which were published as Lectures on Calvinism. This view, however, is a systematic statement of biblical principles. A few points of clarification are needed at this point. First, although this model of social order is usually identified by the term sphere sovereignty, it has been referred to as a form of pluralism and also as a form of political pluralism, since it proposes a plurality of governments in society, each relating to different social spheres, none of which derives its legitimacy or authority from any of the other forms of social government, and none of which takes precedence over the others. The only person to possess sovereignty is Christ himself, who delegates his sovereignty in a restricted form only to specific and limited spheres. This model and the pluralistic terminology sometimes associated with it must not be confused with the modern concept of principled pluralism espoused by some Christian thinkers, which is a different notion altogether in which the state is understood to be a religiously neutral institution that guarantees civil liberty and equality for all religions, thereby creating a multicultural society. This latter notion is really no different from the modern secular humanist concept of the state and the complete antithesis of the idea of the state set forth by Abraham Kuyper and the school of thought associated with his name, which denies the possibility of religious neutrality in any sphere of life, including the political sphere. The terminology of political pluralism was used in the early 20th century by political theorists to describe the alternative to political monism. However, the debate between political pluralism and political monism has now been eclipsed by the triumph of the modern monist state and the general acceptance of its claim to complete sovereignty. The terminology of pluralism is now associated with the modern concept of multiculturalism and a religiously neutral state. Old terms have been given new meanings, and unfortunately, it seems that this has led to confusion over Kuyper's political views among some Christians seeking to justify modern pluralistic ideals. It has been claimed that the modern Christian notion of principled pluralism has its origin in Kuyper's political ideals. This claim seems to be based on an inadequate understanding of Kuyper's thought and ignorance of the nature of the debate regarding monist and pluralist political ideals in the early 20th century. Kuyper died in 1920. A careful reading of Kuyper's works that have been translated into English shows this to be a completely mistaken idea. In Kuyper's model of social order, sphere sovereignty, the state no less than the church and all other institutions is under obligation to honour God and submit obediently to his ordinances. In his lectures on Calvinism, Kuyper stated, and I quote, The magistrates are and remain God's servants. They have to recognise God as supreme ruler, from whom they derive their power. They have to serve God by ruling the people according to his ordinances. They have to restrain blasphemy, where it directly assumes the character of an affront to the divine majesty. And God's supremacy is to be recognised by confessing his name in the constitution as the source of all political power, by maintaining the Sabbath, by proclaiming days of prayer and thanksgiving, and by invoking his divine blessing. Therefore, in order that they may govern according to his holy ordinances, every magistrate is duty-bound to investigate the rights of God both in the natural life and in his word, not to subject himself to the decision of any church, but in order that he himself may catch the light which he needs for the knowledge of the divine will. Unquote. 
Second, according to Abraham Kuyper, and again I quote, The highest duty of the civil government remains therefore unchangeably that of justice, and in the second place it has to care for the people as a unit, partly at home, in order that its unity may grow ever deeper and may not be disturbed, and partly abroad, lest the national existence suffer harm. Unquote. I agree with this secondary role of the civil government only in so far as it is pursued in order to maintain public justice, the primary role of civil government. It is not clear that Kuiper so restricted this secondary role of the state. Kuiper goes on to assert that the state possesses the right and duty, and I quote, whenever different spheres clash, to compel mutual regard for the boundary lines of each, unquote. He also speaks of the state as, and again I quote, the sphere of spheres which encircles the whole extent of human life, unquote. This goes beyond what can be argued on the basis of scripture in my opinion. The Bible does not assign such a role to the state, but gives it a simple role of maintaining public justice. Of course, in many cases, the maintenance of public justice, looked at from the perspective of sphere sovereignty, is precisely just such a matter of enforcing the boundary lines of each sphere. That is to say, the enforcement of public justice in such cases results in the preservation of the sphere's legitimate boundary lines. But to assign this effect of the administration of public justice to the state as its proper purpose is a different matter. Not all cases in which the boundary lines between the spheres are compromised necessitate state involvement. Only those cases in which crimes are committed fall within the jurisdiction of the state. Even in some cases involving principles of justice, the state may be powerless to act since its remit does not extend to all cases of injustice. The Bible limits the jurisdiction of the state more strictly than this. The magistrate's jurisdiction relates to crime, that is to say, acts of injustice for which judicial penalties are prescribed. Consequently, although I use the basic Kuyperian paradigm of sphere sovereignty, I think it needs to be subjected to rigorous definition according to biblical criteria and modified where necessary. Not all sins are crimes. In other words, not all immoral actions of men against other men fall within the jurisdiction of the state. For this reason I define the role of the magistrate or state not simply as the Ministry of Justice but as the Ministry of Public Justice, that is to say cases of injustice to which civil penalties are attached. Issues of public justice for which the magistrate is obliged to provide a remedy constitute therefore a more limited category within the wider sphere of justice. The failure to observe this distinction will result, and has resulted, in a social ethic of rights that has serious consequences for the legal system. Positive discrimination laws are a good example. Undoubtedly, from a Christian point of view, racial discrimination in the labour market is immoral, and therefore unjust. But it would be difficult to justify positive discrimination laws biblically. In fact, such laws can only operate by distorting public justice, that is to say, by creating a form of legally enforced racial discrimination, the very injustice that such legislation is intended to remedy. This kind of racial discrimination is usually but misleadingly referred to as positive discrimination. The same is true of gender discrimination laws. To take another example, a father may unjustly disinherit his children, but the magistrate is powerless to rectify this injustice under God's law. Such disinheritance may be reprehensible morally, but this in itself does not justify the magistrate's taking action against the father. Only God's word can legitimately empower the magistrate to act. The definition of the state as an institution that must compel mutual regard for the boundary lines of each sphere opens the door for the state to act precisely in such a way that may compromise the concept of sphere sovereignty by giving the state a role that exceeds its biblically defined boundaries. It has been pointed out that, and I quote, 
Kuiper did not develop clear criteria for determining when intervention into the economy was necessary or permissible. Consequently, some contemporary Kuiperians advocate large-scale state intervention in order to defend those who cannot care for themselves, despite the fact that Kuiper emphasised the first defence and cultivation of such persons must be undertaken by both the institutional church and individual Christians acting within society. Unquote. It should be remembered, however, that Kuiper was critical of such intervention in the economy by the state. Writing on the jurisdiction of the government, he stated, and I quote, Or do the authorities overstep their bounds when they create labour or reduce competition, raise wages or shorten the work week, and in general support manual labour by making it available only under such conditions which ensure that the manual labourer is also respected as a human being? We believe it beyond doubt that the government does not have this right, at least not in the absolute sense. State and society are not identical. The government is not the only sovereign in the country. Sovereignty exists in distinct spheres, and in each of these smaller circles, this sovereignty is bound to primordial arrangements or ordinances that have been created not by the government, but by the creator of heaven and earth. Only in one instance can these sovereign entities tolerate or even demand government intervention. When two or more of these spheres collide at their common borders and a great imbalance between their respective powers makes it likely that the more powerful entity would suffer from hypertrophy and the other would be inequitably suppressed. To take an example, the point of contact between the sphere of capital and the sphere of manual labour is always a contract, either formally drawn or presupposed. Because the authorities are involved in court cases about contracts, this is the formal point that lies within the reach of government. Unquote. This clearly demonstrates Kuiper's opposition to socialist economic planning, contrary to the misinformed claim sometimes heard that he was a socialist. There is nonetheless an ambiguity in Kuiper's definition of the state as, and I quote, the sphere of spheres which encircles the whole extent of human life, unquote. This is why I do not think that in every respect Kuiper himself fully worked out the implications of his concept of sphere sovereignty. Nevertheless, the sphere sovereignty paradigm is a good one that needs to be developed, refined and applied consistently. End of Lecture 6